Hi everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Crypto Journey, brought to you by Dasset. My name's Al, and I'll be standing in for our regular host, Julia, today. Uh, in today's topic, we're going to be covering decentralized finance lending. Uh, how does it work? We'll be looking at how dApps or decentralized applications, trends, and opportunities are disrupting traditional finance models. Uh, like always, if you have any questions during the presentation, please pop them into the chat and we can look to answer them. Uh, to take us through today's presentation, we are joined by a crypto journey regular DASA CEO, Stephen McCaskill. Uh, hi there, Stephen. How are you doing today? Great. Thanks so much, Alan. And I uh, really appreciate the intro. Today, we are going to talk about decentralized lending and the opportunities that lay ahead particularly in what is now known as decentralized finance. This presentation is brought by Dasset. Dasset is New Zealand's leading tra trading platform for crypto assets with, starting next week, over 100 crypto assets on our platform and 250 uh, markets. Before we start looking at decentralized lending, I thought we might be good to get an idea of the scope of lending within just within New Zealand. And looking at lending within the banking sector, we see that there's $536 billion in loans in New Zealand as of July. Good and bad. Uh, 30, $330 billion in those loans are collateralized by mortgages. Now, this does not include certain loans and uh, certain markets. Uh, private loans are not included in this. So this is really just loans that the banks in New Zealand are providing. So if you break that down to the total New Zealand market or the total crypto market cap, the lending industry in New Zealand is about a third of the size of the entire crypto market. So when you start looking at crypto, you really start seeing how small it really is compared to uh, what we can see in the lending markets. So digging into Ethereum, and this is just Ethereum, not looking at any of the other networks. Uh, when we start including the other networks, the markets are much, much larger. And be, because there's about uh, tw 20 different platform tokens or platforms or networks, uh, virtual machines, and many of them have lending applications and DeFi and other products. So just looking at decentralized finance on lending on Ethereum, and this is in USD, you can see over the last six months, the, the value of the total market in decentralized finance on, on Ethereum has dropped from its all-time high at, towards the end of last year. And a big part of that, uh, the valuations, of the assets that are locked in here uh, have dropped substantially, uh, a, lot of, a lot less use today than there was uh, eight months ago. And so even at its height in November of last year, uh, 150 billion US. So the entire global DeFi market on Ethereum was still smaller than the lending market within New Zealand uh, for banks. So it's, it's still even uh, narrowed down. And where we see the value, um, we, we see that there's still a long way to go. And you'll find in the news, a lot of people are saying Bitcoin is dead, Ethereum is dead, crypto blockchain is dead. Uh, there's actually a great website, Bitcoin Obituaries, that has every major news outlet saying Bitcoin has been dead for the last 14 years. Uh, we're coming up on, on Bitcoin's 14th year in existence. And the reality is 
we're just getting stronger. This industry, DeFi, didn't exist three years ago. So it went from zero to 150 billion US in, in market size, currently sitting at about 50 billion US in, in market size. And you can see that there's enormous potential. Um, we're still working on, from an industry perspective, the right on-ramps and the way to bring these products to the masses. And there's a long way to go. So you can see this is really the first bubble in DeFi. And what it's really enabling is the market and the industry to get stronger and grow stronger. And uh, some of these changes do rely heavily on infrastructure changes. For example, the need for scalability and uh, user friendliness so we can have greater adoption. So we are still working on those things where we can see things like the Ethereum merge is helping us move a little bit in that direction. But to get several billion people into utilizing this technology, we still have a few years to go. And that is where the opportunities lie. So when we look at lending specifically, we can see that it's extremely small as a market globally. It's a drop in the bucket for somebody like Elon Musk, it's a blink of an eye. Uh, 300 and, or, or $536 billion New Zealand dollar mark, uh, lending in New Zealand. Whereas right now the lending market on Ethereum sits at 5 billion US, which is something like 7 billion New Zealand dollars. Drop in the bucket compared to, you know, that's what, 1%, 1%, uh, a little bit over 1.5% 1, 1 of the entire New Zealand lending market. So very small. And when uh, we, we looked at New Zealand as a whole, we could see that the lending is, is collateralized heavily uh, something like 60, 70 percent by mortgages, uh, by equity in New Zealand. And so uh, we, we still need that technology into crypto where there is digital representation of your home, of that asset on the blockchain. We still do not have NFTs. We do a little bit in some countries, but it's, it's still so early that we have not started that process of digitizing that representation of ownership of things like our homes and our cars. As soon as that happens, as soon as we have courts and legal systems acknowledge that digital ownership represents ownership in the physical thing, this industry will start moving in a much bigger direction and a much bigger um, size than, than what we've seen previously. So when we look at lending rates, lending rates are have dropped substantially, partly because a lot less people are borrowing. So why is there less value locked in lending? Partly because less people are borrowing, a lot less people are borrowing, a lot less people are lending. And uh, we'll, we'll get into that. But as we can see, uh, lending rates right now. So if you were, if you had, let's see, the highest is, looks like USDC, something like that, uh, USDT. And the highest lending rate is less, probably less than 2%. We, we can look at what the exact rates are, but you can see they're pretty low. And so if you had some USDC sitting around, put it in here, and you would be earning about 2%, uh, which is probably about the same as, as what, uh, well, uh, may, maybe not what you could get at a bank, but maybe what you can get at a bank pretty soon with interest rates rising around the world. And so uh, how do these lending apps work? Well, they work very similar to how you would expect lending to work between two people. 
uh, to some extent. So you have a lender, you have a borrower. A borrower cannot borrow unless there's somebody who has collateral or has assets that they are willing to lend. So it does require two parties. There are no borrowers, then the lenders uh, have assets that nobody wants. If there are no lenders and borrowers who have a need to borrow assets, won't be able to borrow anything. And this is what really dictates the interest rates. If there are is a huge demand to borrow, interest rates will go up, and that incentivizes lenders to lend more. If there's no demand for borrowing, then lenders will, uh, so then interest rates will drop, and lenders will have less incentive to lend. They'll want to use their capital somewhere else. How it's different in DeFi is that all borrowing requires collateral. If you do not have collateral, you cannot borrow. So that collateral depends on what, um, what, what you want to borrow but uh, and what application you're using, but it has to really be either a recognized stablecoin or a crypto asset that is has a, a lot of liquidity that is recognized by the app as something that they would take as collateral. So something that has a market cap of $1 million wouldn't really be uh, an asset that you could borrow against. But something like Bitcoin, which has a much larger market cap, very easy to liquidate and sell, would be accepted as collateral. Something like Ethereum as well. Uh, as soon as you start going down that list, there's less liquidity, uh, harder to buy or sell because when you do, you, if you have a large amount, say $100 million of a certain token, then you could move that market. And so that's where it's less likely that you'll be able to provide that as collateral. There are very early stage platforms that allow people to borrow and lend NFTs. So uh, it's still a very, very immature market compared to borrowing and lending something like Ethereum or a stablecoin. So the other thing is that the entity that connects the borrow and lender is an application as opposed to a banker or an analyst where you, if you needed to borrow some money to buy a home, you would have to submit an application. Somebody would need to review it. There would be a lot of uh, overhead, a lot of uh, middlemen, a lot of oracles to evaluate the, the, the valuation of that property and mortgage, your credit worthiness, uh, a lot of other things. And so uh, in this case, when we're using a DeFi platform, the software is cutting all of that out and, and managing it for you. And this is where the assets really need to be recognized by that protocol, such as Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, USDC. And so as a borrower, you deposit or uh, you, you deposit your crypto asset that you are put it providing as collateral, whether it's Bitcoin, ETH, or stablecoin, and it gets deposited into a smart contract. And that is an app, uh, that's software that holds and manages that pool of collateral. Once you've made that deposit, you can borrow against that. Depending on what application you're borrowing, you can borrow different amounts. So if you deposit $200 worth of Bitcoin, you might be able to borrow hundred dollars in stablecoin. It really depends and these levels have changed over time based on the governance and the rules of that application. So if you are a lender, the opposite occurs. You have some collateral, you have some assets that you want to earn yield on, and you deposit it into a pool. 
deposit into a smart contract or software that pulls all the lenders crypto assets once it's pulled in there that is a, a large amount of the asset could be uh we'll look at how much the numbers are but anywhere from 10 to 100 million dollars in, in pooled lender assets and that helps dictate the interest rates for the borrowers and lenders by by determining uh how much is, is going in how much is going out and so as a lender you you deposit and if a borrower comes and borrows from this pool then the interest that that borrower pays gets distributed to the lenders equally so if 50 percent of all of the lenders assets are being borrowed then the, the, the fees would be distributed to uh, those lenders, and it's really 50% of those assets that are being put to work. So you're not putting, so not all the assets are getting put to work. Borrowers aren't borrowing all of it, and so the interest rates will be lower, essentially. So after that, the borrowers have to pay interest that interest is automatically deducted from and uh, they can also uh, settle at the end if they do not settle then that interest accrues until the collateral must be liquidated to cover the entire uh, amount that the borrower borrowed and that is when it reaches a certain threshold and so if for example somebody deposits a hundred dollars worth of bitcoin they borrow fifty dollars worth of bitcoin over time uh say bitcoin price drops by 50 percent then or even less than that if the price of bitcoin drops uh 40 percent then that person's Bitcoin will be sold and the person will no longer have a loan, but they also no longer have the Bitcoin that they put up as collateral. And so uh, interest is distributed, the, the, that the borrowers pay uh, is distributed to three different entities. The first are the lenders. The second are oracles. And those are ent uh, third parties that provide price feeds so that the application knows what the price of those assets are so they know what the price of bitcoin is they know what the price of ethereum is so that the app can identify when those assets or if those assets need to be liquidated because if the bitcoin price drops uh, substantially then the application needs to know what that bitcoin price is so the app pays the entities that are providing the Bitcoin price, a uh, little bit of the interest for that service. And then lastly, the stakers. The stakers are people who are vested in the application and they are putting in risk. Uh, they're staking the, to cover any kind of losses that may occur through the liquidation process. So there is risk for stakers. So this is where we come to governance and staking. And we're going to, so there are a few different applications. They work differently. Uh, some of those applications include DAI or MakerDAO, Aave, and Compound. Uh, a lot of this presentation is, is around Aave's application. So some of the numbers will be different uh, based on different lending applications. But, and, and also some of the uh, rules and utility around the tokens vary from lending platform to lending platform. This is how it generally works. And uh, again, so, so the mechanics will vary depending on the application. And so, so it's really important if you want to get into uh, looking at ways to generate income or utilize these lending applications that you understand the rules of the application. So generally, as a token holder, 
you have say over the governance of that application and, and that you have a vote. And generally one vote is uh, one token. And so if you own 50% of the tokens in that application, you have 50% of the vote. And if you have 1% of the tokens, you have 1% of the vote. And voting really varies. It varies on what interest, how, how to adjust or set the interest rates either algorithmically or uh, fixed rates, because there are some fixed uh, rates depending on how some of the protocols work. The set uh, rules such as what assets can should be accepted in the protocol, what can be recognized as an application, how funds should be distributed for things like marketing. So it's almost like, uh, I'd hate to say it, but it's almost like a company. I mean, it, it isn't a company because of the way that the, you know, this is software that millions of people around the world can participate in or not dis participate in. If you have a token, you don't have to vote. Uh, nothing will happen if you don't vote. But if you do vote, if you do stake, then you can receive some of the interest from uh, the payouts or the rewards from the, those, uh, the income that's generated on that application. So staking, staking for Aave, they call it the safety module. And this is risky. There is a risk here. Uh, shouldn't say it's risky, but there is risk. And that risk is if the lending protocol becomes under collateralized, then you can lose a portion of your stake. The software, uh, and, and this is where, as a voter, you have a say over how much uh, uh, in the, uh, over some of these rules. But for Aave's um, uh, for, for Aave's rules, if you stake and Aave becomes under collateralized, then you can lose up to thirty percent of your stake to cover that loss. So you can stake Ethereum or you can stake Aave and receive a portion of the fees paid in interest. So it's not completely risk-free where you're just generating revenue from interest. If there is a major event, for example, if the Ethereum blockchain freezes and the network goes down, which has never happened before, but it has done on other protocols such as Solana, say a network goes down, and a token drops 80, 90%, then the software can't run and liquidate those assets. And so without being able to liquidate those assets in the software, or by the time those assets do get liquidated, the amount of collateral in the application has the potential to be less than what is owed to the lenders. And in that case, the application will, I don't want to use the word confiscate, but will take 30% of the assets locked in the stake and use those assets to make the protocol whole. So there is a risk. And we've seen this type of risk in legacy markets. Somebody was telling me about Lloyd's of I believe it was Lloyd's of London, they, uh, maybe in, in the 80s or 90s after something like an oil spill. And the, there were a number of wealthy owners uh, that were providing uh, uh, collateral in, in this insurance company. And they had to dip into their own pockets to pay out. And so very similar to things that we've seen in the in, uh, in history can happen here. But these types of events are something that you don't see on a daily basis. It's something you don't expect to happen today, tomorrow, this month. Might be something that you see or expect in a decade or a hundred years, who knows? And that is the theory. What is going to happen in, in reality 
only time will tell. But so far, none of the DeFi, I, I shouldn't say none, but the lending applications that we've seen that have been successful thus far have not been under collateralized. We have seen stable coins that have been under collateralized that are algorithmic, and that has caused major problems. But in lending, we have not seen that yet. Uh, that doesn't mean that we won't. Uh, who knows if we will? Um, and I, I should say we, we have actually seen that, but it's generally because of a software exploit where there was a vulnerability or an exploit as opposed to the assets needing to be liquidated and the assets weren't liquidated fast enough, which caused this under collateralized event. So um, when you stake, there's also a cool down period. So you don't get your assets back immediately. You have to wait 10 days before you can unstake. And uh, so that's to help create a little bit more certainty in the ecosystem. So uh, these are very specific to Aave, but there's the liquidation side. Doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. And how it works is a loan is collateralized with stablecoin or crypto. Um, that's, and it, it really depends, but the it, it used to be something like 50%. Now it's 75%. Uh, these numbers might change. Uh, and so definitely check what the, the rules are for the application because it does vary. But basically, if the value of the asset, the loan to value um, drops to 80%, then that is when you get liquidated. And so how that works is the asset gets sold through a decentralized exchange. I have to look at exactly what they use, but my guess is they use Uniswap where most liquidity is. So if you're borrowing USD, if you're borrowing a stablecoin USDT, you're providing Ethereum as collateral, you put in a hundred dollars in, um, uh, you, you're putting in a hundred dollars, you borrow 50, the value of that Ethereum drops where it's now worth something like um, uh, it's $55, then you get liquidated and they'll sell the Ethereum on Uniswap and you walk away from that, but you no longer have your Ethereum. So these are liquidations over since beginning of time for DeFi. As you can see, there have been a few months that have had some pretty brutal liquidation events. And generally it's a result of what's happening in the market. So May, 2021, I think it was 15th of May, Coinbase went through an IPO. That was the height of the first top in the market last, last year. And then the market dropped substantially. So it was likely that when the market dropped substantially, it resulted in those liquidations, which looked to be the biggest last year, May 2021. Then uh, towards the end of the year, in November, markets started dropping. January, they dropped a bit. So that's where you can see this liquidation. And in May, you can see a massive liquidation. And I say massive, but when you look at the dollar values, they are a drop in the bucket compared to what's happening in, in the legacy financial markets. So these are in US dollars. The biggest liquidation event for lending markets uh, on Ethereum. So this doesn't include lending on other networks. So at the same time this happened, you uh, in, in May 2022, there were likely liquidations and other networks, but Ethereum is, is by far the biggest. So you can see 
1.4 billion, maybe a bit more USD was liquidated, which is a very small amount. And last year, about 750 million US was, was liquidated. So again, they, these are really small amounts in on the grand scheme of things. Uh, to put it in perspective, uh, a few Fridays ago, the stock market dropped and wiped out $1.5 trillion in value. And that was the New York Stock Exchange. And so, um, you know, that's a uh, legacy market in one day. When so we're not even close to those sizes in, in crypto. So you can kind of see the where we're going with that. Um, very small in terms of the market, but opportunity very big. So let's uh, look at an application and see what's um, what's what's actually uh, happening right now on, on one of these lending platforms. Uh, before I begin, do we have any questions? Uh, no questions at this point. Great. Okay, so Aave, uh, I go to Aave because um, you'll see that most of the lending is happening here. They say that the total size, and this is specific to Ethereum, so you can see Aave actually supports a number of different networks, not just Ethereum. And also you can see version one, version two. So these are changes in their smart contracts. And so there might be a liquidity pool in the uh, in one of these other versions that you might not be able to access just because the software is a, a little bit older. But we look at the Ethereum market, market size 5.32 billion. They only do it in USD. So I can't, um, they don't have an automatic NZD value, unfortunately, but uh, we can see where it is here. Uh, we can see different assets, how much it, lenders are providing. So that's total supplied, the percentage you can borrow for lending and how much is being borrowed and what the interest rate is for borrowing. So interesting, finance, USD. So this is an asset that the applica Aave application token holders have decided to accept as an asset for borrowing lending. And $26.7 million has been deposited. And of that, only 6.5 million US has been borrowed. So if you are a lender, you're going to get 0.27%. Pretty low. And a big reason why is not many people are borrowing. Only 25% uh, only of the uh, loaned funds are being borrowed. So, and you can see here total. So 5.32 billion is um, the entire size of the market. So that's what you could borrow up to. But 3.82 billion is available. So, uh, 1.51 being borrowed. So less than 50% of all loaned assets are being borrowed right now. And uh, there's a big reason why crypto assets are down substantially. And so there's uh, people um, don't necessarily want to borrow against a much lower valued crypto asset. People might be worried about liquidation uh, there's a lot of this lending did was used by entities like traders, and so they might be out of the market right now. And so there's many different reasons that hundreds of thousands of people would be using this, and so uh, and and why they might be lending or borrowing. And so um, we see going down here that there are a number of different rates, depending on the assets that are being lent or borrowed. So you can see LUSD, wow, supply 13%, and borrowers are paying 48%. So why is that? I actually have no idea. And this is where 
markets, you can see that markets are just reflecting information that we don't have to know that information, but if that is a risk appetite we're willing to take, then it might be something we want to participate in. You can see only $200,000 is being supplied, 179,000 being borrowed. There might be some kind of uh, the, the, the staking or incentive for people to do this could be high risk, which is why the interest rates are really high. And so that is where you might see a spike. So Fay USD, the borrow rate is insane, 149%. So you have to pay 149% per year. So you might just be borrowing it for an hour or something, but a huge rate to borrow this stable coin. And you can see almost 100% of the lent stable coin is being borrowed. I don't know why it's 0% for the lenders. Uh, that is something you'd have to dig into uh, to figure out why. So 8% here. So this is Terra, uh, US Terra. So you can see, I don't know if anyone would want to touch that, but 8% for lending. Uh, and then there are different tokens that aren't necessarily stable coins that you could borrow or lend against. And again, these are totally variable. So what you see here as the interest rate in an hour could be 0.7%. So there's only a spike may, because there might be something happening in the market that is increasing the number of borrowers. So that is why you're never going to have a guaranteed rate. This rate isn't going to be there long term and has a lot of different market factors that, uh, that change these rates. This is why there are some applications that are more aggregators where you deposit and they'll aggregate into a number of different pools to maybe aver to average out these, these rates. So the other thing, and it's a bit tricky, when you start looking at the documentation, you'll start seeing different numbers. And so it's, it is important to kind of get an idea of what the actual uh, rules are of the game. And this is where it was actually kind of difficult, yet, unless you are a developer and looking at the code, to dig into figuring out what the risks are with staking. And it's only because I've, I've seen, I've looked through lots of these before, but I kind of had to dig into migration and staking, understand the that the how staking works, that they have this thing called the safety module that is a way to reward people for uh, taking that risk of providing liquidity in the event of what they call shortfall event. And so uh, the incentives for staking, again, they're not very direct about it. So uh, you have to kind of dig in to figure out what you're actually getting as a part of the revenue or reward of, of Aave tokens. And uh, they the get, get a little bit into the um, unstaking and to go into the uh, safety module, they, they kind of give a little bit more information of how it works. So if you own a token for the lending application, you can govern and uh, make rules around the entire ecosystem. You, have, if you can stake into the safety module. You don't have to stake if you don't want to. Uh, if you don't stake, you don't get revenue. Um, but at the same time, you also don't take the risk of the token um, of, of losing your collateral if there is what they call a shortfall event. Then there's the application. The application earns revenue. That revenue is distributed to the oracles that are providing the data feeds, the entities that are providing collateral for risk, and um, they also collect a little bit so it also goes to the, the lenders, of course, and then they put some in almost like an, an insurance app. So 
that in the, the event of a shortfall event, they have a little bit of reserve assets themselves that they'll use to cover any deficits. So that's basically how the lending applications work. So far, the ah, and, and they go into different types of short fall events where, where there could be a, a few different types, uh, a bug or flaw in the actual software. Liquidations, if the um, network fails and Ethereum drops 95%, then there could be a risk there. Then Oracle failure. There is also the risk of the oracles lying about the data or failing to provide accurate data. And that uh, could cause some issues as well. So uh, there are those types of risks. And in the event that that happens, that, that capital might be, uh, that, that uh, pool of funds might be under collateralized. And so um, these rules are subject to change based on being a token holder and, and voting on what those rules should be. So uh, why don't we open it up to questions? Yeah, we've got a question from Jonathan. Um, he goes on to ask, most lending is in the crypto market for speculation. Uh, what do you see as the first use case for the real economy? Mm, great question. I do think you're right that a lot of lending is driven by speculation or betting on the markets or hedging on the markets. However, I do see, uh, and, and I don't know what the numbers are, we can see the the total amount that's being lent or borrowed, but we don't necessarily know those purposes. If people are borrowing and then making their trades on chain, then we could have a better idea of whether that, that borrowing is specific to uh, hedging or, or leveraging their trades. But I would say that in certain jurisdictions, there are opportunities to use borrowing or lending as a way to mitigate your tax burdens rather than have a, um, and, and this is really subject to the jurisdiction. So if you deposit Ethereum into a lending application, that may be considered a taxable event in some jurisdictions and some it may not. And it really comes down to uh, a number of things uh, and, and how it's, it's treated. So uh, I'm not saying how it is in, in New Zealand, but in some jurisdictions, that is a, I think, a really uh, major use case for people that may not want to sell their ETH and uh, have a tax um, burden where they may want to borrow against their ETH and repay and have their ETH in the future without necessarily having to have a taxable event. So uh, I think that could be one. Also, I wouldn't be surprised if people have used this to buy assets in the real world. Uh, to, so you might have Ethereum and you want to buy a car so you put Ethereum up as collateral to use dollars to buy a car. But we are, the, the NFT market, there are a number of, uh, at least two, three that I know of that enable lending against NFTs. So that market's starting to mature uh, along with creating a lot more fungibility for NFTs. Those NFTs are digital assets but it's, I think we're, we're very close to having your Tesla or your, your house as an NFT that you can put into one of these apps to get a, a loan against and, or a mortgage. And so I don't know from a, a innovation perspective where that can materialize. It might be smaller things like you have a bicycle 
and uh, you, you get a you can get that tokenized and that's an asset and you get a loan against it or so I don't know what this um, the size of the market's going to be there whether it's going to be a lot, lot easier for smaller things or micro loans because those those micro loans may have less red tape compared to things like homes uh, especially when it comes to things like oracles so oracles in this environment are pretty straightforward to identify what the price of bitcoin is to and provide that into the application or feed that into the application but to have an oracle that can evaluate the price of a home and the um, the issues in that home, you know, the structural issues or see if there's water damage and really give that evaluation and then put that into the blockchain. You know, that's the same concept. They are an Oracle and that Oracle needs to be trusted by the network and, and provide valid information. So I think for certain assets that are like homes, it might be harder to evaluate something like precious metals, something like uh, Picasso, there's only so many Picassos. There, those valuations are, uh, I think, a lot easier to get. There's a lot less oracles, a lot less experts that can say, okay, this Picasso is worth that much. And there's kind of an agreement maybe between three different art dealers, and they become the oracles for that valuation of that art. Uh, might actually be easier for very unique high value items than hundreds of thousands or millions of homes. And so it's it's really going to be an evolutionary process and who can crack the Oracle problem, who can crack the regulatory problem, and lastly, who can crack the uh, user friendliness to for mass adoption. But one area could very well be in the uh, credit card market, the consumer credit market. I think it might be a bit challenging because you need some kind of collateral, but this could be a way to distribute or create more peer-to-peer -peer lending for credit cards where you have a friend, they want to have a credit card uh, somewhere in a place like Brazil, you post $100 in collateral, and now your friend has $50 on a card that they can go and use and uh, repay that card. And you get as, as your, the friend some, some of that interest. You know, I think there's potentially some, some consumer um, tools that uh, or, or consumer products there that are a lot easier uh, because you're dealing with fungible tokens uh, like a stable coin or a ETH or Bitcoin, as opposed to unique items that are a little bit more difficult to evaluate from an Oracle perspective. So, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, I, I, and, and yes, I don't know, too hard to say, but maybe those consumer retail products could be a lot easier, maybe even in those markets that have been really hard to crack, like South America or or parts of Asia, where they there's a huge barrier to entry for those people because of banking system, because of identi identity issues, where micro loans, micro transactions can help build those those markets up. Next question. Yeah, uh, Jonathan's got a couple uh, more and uh, Mark's chimed in as well. So I'll just uh, follow up with Jonathan's recent one. Uh, what are the complications of moving lines between crypto and fiat? Depends on what you mean by fiat. If you are referring to stablecoin, then the friction is a lot less from a technology perspective because there are liquidity pools and decentralized exchange that allow you to sell Ethereum for USDC or sell USDC for or buy Ethereum with USDC. So in the event of a liquidation event, you're selling Ethereum on a decentralized exchange for 
a stable coin. And so there are issues around that stable coin being valid, uh, you know, having that it's pegged, that kind of stuff. Now, moving dollars or euro or pounds from your bank account and getting it into that, into the system, that is where there's a lot more friction, where it is sending it from your bank account to an entity or a bridge like DASIT, where you have to convert it into a digital asset and, uh, for you to work in the system or, or be part of the system. So from a legal perspective or regulatory perspective, there it's a bit murky. And uh, that's, that's I, th I think, is where we're, 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 we're still trying to work out. Some of these DeFi applications are providing AML KYC pools. So there is a um, pool of assets that regulated financial service providers can tap into that everyone has to go through an AML KYC process to tap into that market. So there are some products out there that are working where they're using the smart contracts, they're using open protocols, but even though they're open protocols, the rules of the software will only enable um, the token holders that uh, vote or allow certain participants to participate and interact with that liquidity pool. And so, um, so yeah, so, so they're using the same software, they're using open source software, but they're gatekeepers based on certain rules. And so that's, uh, I think, a, a really good development to make more legacy entities uh, comfortable in, in entering this market and, and offering certain DeFi products, but it's, yeah, it's still still very murky because regulators are, are still trying to catch up to what's the, the 2017 wave and the innovation there. So they haven't really wrapped their head around what's this this last wave in, in 2020. Yeah, uh, Mark's uh, question is, whenever you are providing liquidity and you get remunerated uh, in the local token, for example, DFX, can you then generally go and stake the governance token? So I'm assuming he's meaning the yield. And if so, where do you look to do that? DFX is a slightly uh, different application. It's more uh, on the decentralized exchange. So as, as far as I know, there's no lending on DFX, but you can certainly provide capital to earn fees or, um, or, or newly minted tokens. And you can certainly put that into governance or uh, earn, earn fees as well. So uh, when we look at lending applications like Aave, if you're depositing BUSD, people are borrowing BUSD, you're going to get paid interest in BUSD. So that means that, uh, and I might be wrong, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's how it works here. And so you would have to convert that BUSD that you earn in interest into Aave that you can then stake and earn some more fees. So if you, uh, I don't know the exact amounts, but say 80% of the fees are distributed to the lenders, you get 80%, you put that 80% into Aave, um, or you put an equal amount into the lending pool and you buy Aave, and as a staker and you stake Aave, and you get 10% of the fees. So you could increase the amount of fees that you get from 80% to 90% if you are lending BUSD and staking Aave. Now, if you're lending BUSD, there is the risk of it, you, you being under collateralized and not getting your full uh, amount that you've lent. But the people who have staked are uh, will be liquidated up to 30% to make you whole. So in, in a way, uh, if you're a lender, 
you um, are higher up the ranks in, in um, credit worthiness or as a creditor to get your um, your lent funds back than if you were to stake in the um, the safety module. So that's that's kind of interesting as well, where you're more likely to be made whole as a lender than if you are staking as a protocol participant. But if you are doing both, then and it, the protocol becomes under collateralized, then you are at risk of uh, both. If, if it becomes under collateralized, losing a portion of what you've loaned and losing up to 30% of uh, your stake. But there, it could very well be, you see there are many different markets. And so uh, you could be lending in one market and staking in uh, Ave, and the market that you're lending in doesn't get under collateralized. Another market gets under collateralized. So what you're staking in, in the market, believe you're not going to lose, but your stake, you could lose. So you might be in a position where uh, you, you are staking BUSD um, or lending BUSD, and you're staking Ave and Gemini dollar for whatever reason becomes under collateralized. Uh, I don't think it, as lending BUSD that you will necessarily be impacted. Um, there are, I did notice that there are a couple of rules where they have like isolated lending markets. So uh, you do kind of want to look at that where you might be able to isolate the risk to that one market. And it's just got a quick follow up on what sort of range of returns might you be able to get? Really depends on the market and the assets and uh, you, you know, what, what we see here is you know, stable coin. So let's see if we can look at the top ones. So USD, 1.38 billion USD coin is being supplied. Only uh, about a third of that is being borrowed. Yield that you get for lending is 0.41%. So less than half a percent, uh, which isn't very much. You could probably get that get more than that in the bank at, at this time. So, so you can see that it's pretty low, but let's see if we look at the details. Might give us, uh, it's not really giving us a long time frame. So this is only over the last month. So you can see a month ago, it was 0.6%. So it's it's dropped substantially a down to 0.17%. Now it's increased, um, it's doubled over the last, week. can't see further back, but what you'll see or, or look at is potentially last year, it got high as three, four, five percent. But it really depends on the time of the day or the time of the month. And the the markets, there's, there's so many different factors, Bar all these market participants and things that are happening will impact them. Where some people are playing the borrowing or the lending game where they will pull assets out of one pool and put them into another to maximize their yield. So right now, the highest yield is synthetics, 34%. So if you have any, you can earn 34%, but tomorrow might drop down to 2%. So this is where it's not guaranteed, it's variable, it changes by the second. Uh, you can deposit and five minutes later, take out your what you've earned and remove your uh, what you've lent. So I don't know what's going on with this stable coin. Thirteen percent could be risky. U.S. Terra. I don't know if you want to touch that, uh, but the closest stable USD stable coin two point two seven percent. Tether one point four one. Right. Again, tomorrow could be half that. We, we really don't know uh, what, what it's going to be you know, in an hour from now or tomorrow. Ethereum, less than 1%. Decentralized, half a percent. So you, you can kind of see, oh, this is ranked by rates. So I wonder what Bitcoin is. Ah, there's Bitcoin, 0.08%. So if you're lending Bitcoin, that is your interest, which is, uh, you know, is it even worth putting 
your Bitcoin into the, the pool uh, and, and risking Oracle failure or you know other kind of risks, you, you can get insurance too. So that is a topic that somebody suggested we go over in the mechanics and looking at that as, as the an opportunity in the industry. So you can see from a size of the market, this is a drop in the bucket is, is so small compared to just the New Zealand lending market. And that is where the opportunities lie because I don't think this is gonna get smaller. Don't quote me on that, you know, in the next day, in the next week, markets might get, uh, the lending markets might get a bit smaller, but in terms of developers, in terms of product, in terms of users that are using this over the next few years, we're, we're only going to see that increase. Uh, this is from Jonathan again. I see myself as having a bag of crypto or NFT for my house and being able to borrow against them um, instantaneously for short periods. Is this going to happen? Absolutely. So something I didn't really talk about are flash loans. And that is a loan that happens with within one settlement. So somebody can borrow 50 or $100 million from some of these protocols and pay for, and so, uh, pay for something and repay the loan before the next block confirmation. So it all happens within one settlement period or one block. And so that's a fraction of a set second where we've seen people borrow millions of dollars to do, use it for something and repay. We've already seen that. It's actually caused a lot of problems in the ecosystem. It's helped create the, make the ecosystem a little bit more resilient to see what some of the issues are. We're gonna see a lot more of that. Use your house in Switzerland to get a mortgage in Chile. You know, we're, we're, this is going to help all kinds of markets around the world, and it's going to unlock enormous amounts of capital. So uh, that, that's also where you can see the, the use in, in microtransactions, flash loans, instant loans that last seconds, minutes, uh, hours. So really exciting stuff there. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Alan. You'll start seeing Alan a lot more as our community manager. And uh, you'll be giving a presentation fairly soon, which I'm really looking forward to. So uh, you might not know about it yet, but um, yeah, we'll keep uh, joining us for Crypto Journeys and great to see everyone. Thanks, Sarah.